The podcast this week is sponsored by Bertram, 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 Bertram and Sons, the best lawyers in town. I hereby warrant that this is my honest opinion, and that I am not contractually obliged to make this claim, having no binding relationship with the company in question, and that I, the underside... Oh, oh wait, I wasn't supposed to read that last bit, was I? Never mind, Bertram, 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 Bertram and Sons are the best... Definitely. All the tabletop role playing news. We aim to amuse and we aim to enthuse. And Morris is unofficial tabletop RPG. Hello, 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 and welcome to Morris's unofficial tabletop RPG talk, episode number 99. 99! I am. 99, I am Russ, a.k.a. Morris, or Morris, a.k.a. Russ, and with me this week is... Peter Coffey from the Southampton Guild of Role Players. Russ, as ever, it's an absolute delight to be here. I'm episode completely 99? Stoked. Episode 99, can you believe that? Like, you know, that is a lot of episodes. It's technically our 100th episode, because, of course, we count episode 0, which was our pilot episode, which was so good we decided to release it anyway. Because that's just yes, how we roll. Yeah, so it's, it's our 100th episode, but it's episode 99, and next week is episode, episode number 100. 100. 100. Good times. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to quickly say, um, I did ask last week if people would kindly send in some things for us to read out, or even better, yeah. some things for us to actually play if they wanted to record them. Yes. Um, have got a couple of emails. Fantastic. And we've got a week to go, so if some people would yeah. send some more in, that would be great. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm looking forward to reading, like, uh, our listener feedback. Not reader feedback. They don't read this podcast. Unless you're listening in the extremely far from future, where, due to its massive success, people have gone back and produced transcripts of Morris's unofficial tabletop RPG talk, and you are, in fact, reading that, in which case you should really just listen to these things, because I can't see it being worth reading, but... You do you, you crazy beautiful people. It'll be, it'll be all positive. We'll read out all the nice stuff. What, both except of them? I have asked Malik the Maleficent to read out all our bad reviews. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Malik the Maleficent. Oh. Okay, so that's going to be 30 minutes of Malik the Maleficent talking. Marvellous. Marvellous. How many bad reviews do you think we've got? I don't know. But it just takes so long to say anything. <laughs> 13 minutes of bad reviews. God, have some faith. <laughs> oh, you got to have faith, faith, faith. <laughs> right, anyway, after that really, really long and rambling intro. Yeah, yeah. Well, we uh, it, it, it's what's going to happen. If people go to write reviews, we should be enthusiastic about them. And we were certainly enthusiastic about talking about that one. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Hey, Russ, I have an idea. Mm -hmm. Like, this might be crazy coming out of left field, but... Mm. How about we talk about some RPG news? All right, then. Let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah, let's, do... let's do Let's shake it up a bit. Talk about some RPG news. All good times. Should we start in ancient Greece? Mm, maybe we could. Maybe we couldn't. I have two ancient Greece-related RPG news items for you. Exciting. One's good news and one's bad news. Which one do you want first? Uh, let's see. I'll have the bad news first. The bad news first. Okay, the bad news is a mythic Odysseys of Theros for D&D, &D, yes. Wizards of the Coast, has been delayed. Oh, that is bad news. Very sad. What's the good news? No massive surprise, to be honest. It's uh, yeah. the updated release. It was June the 2nd. It was going to be coming out. So yeah, yeah. in, what, three, four weeks. Yes. It's now going to be July the 21st. Oh, that, well, that's not too bad. But, I mean, to be fair, delays happen... We've got a global pandemic. It's fine. We we, we can we can improvise, adapt, and overcome. Mm, yeah, I mean, they, uh, Wizards of the Coast specifically said, you know, the printers are closed. So yes, that will delay yeah. the production of yeah, printed yeah, material. Yeah. The printer's yeah, being closed, yeah. yes. So there's not a lot you can do about that, but... Um, That's true. Yeah, just wait another month, I guess. Yes, yes. Actually, so it's another two months, actually. About a month and a half. More time to prep your killing plans involving gorgons and harpies. Oh, my. Oh my! Right. Well, the good, the, good, centers, am I? the good news is there's a, a, a new ancient Greece themed D and D source book. <laughs> I think this is the seventh now. Oh my days! Okay, 
<laughs> yes. All aboard the ancient Greece This train. one, this was one is called Ancient Adventures. Ancient Adventures. Hmm. And you can get it from Drive Through RPG. It's by Mal and Tal Enterprises. Mal and Tal Enterprises. Interesting. And. Yeah, uh, the guide includes an overview of life in ancient Greece, new species and classes, changes to how skills work, new arms and armour, a guide to the Greek pantheon, dozens of new magic items, and monsters. Yes, and that was Ancient Adventures. Ancient Adventures. Not to be confused with 20 epic stories from the Bible, the colouring book edition. No. Which is the first thing that comes up when I Google it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> so try Ancient Adventures Drive Through RPG. I've got Ancient Adventures by Michael Tresker. That's it. Hey, there we go. Good. But they have chosen wisely. Oh, yes, yeah, so it's got like a, I suppose, like a Spartan with a red cloak, probably holding a spear. 12 new species, 23 new subclasses. Mm. Mm. You City can play States. the one eyed Arim. Arimaspos. I don't know what that is. The crab shelled Cabiro. Snake tailed Cecrops. Okay. Oh. I assume they're Greek, ancient Greek monsters or creatures, but I'm not well. familiar with that. But it does say you can have Amazons, centaurs, gorgons, minotaurs, nymphs, pans, sirens, and more. And unicorns, apparently. The Hippo Monokeros. Hmm. So when it says you can play a gorgon, does it mean you can play a gorgon, or does it mean you can play a gorgon? That's okay. a question. That is a question. Is but it a D&D Gorgon, or is it an ancient Greek Gorgon? It'll be an ancient Greek Gorgon, to be fair. You reckon? And that was... Yeah, I do. What, what D&D calls a Medusa? Yeah. Hey, Age of Sigma. Age of Sigma. The Warhammer fantasy setting. Yeah. So we're going to have Emmett from Cubicle 7 on the podcast in two weeks, and he's going to talk okay. all about Age of Sigma Soul Band. But in the meantime... Yes. In the meantime... Well, uh, Cubicle 7 has done two things. Yes. First of all, they shared a quick look at the Age of Sigma Soulbound Collector's Edition. Interesting. Which looks absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, so it's got this sort of blue uh, faux leather cover with um, gold foil um, inscription on it. And it comes in a magnetically sealed box. Oh, nice. Oh, that is pretty. Oh, Sorry. It's sort of this rich, deep royal blue, and you've got mm. that oh, that lovely gold leaf, and it's obviously gold leaf along the um, like the uh, what do you call that effect when it's like along the very edges of the page? Um, um. Well, look, like normally it's just like a bit of blank paper along the edge of the book you can see on the outside, but it's got like oh, gold I see, leaf there. yeah, yeah, oh, has it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it has. I don't know what you call that. Uh, but oh, yeah, it's really it's nice like, but like the outside, the, but the 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 sort of a gold leaf long, like the very edges of the page where you can see it. Gold gilt leaf. edges is the phrase they use. Gold gilt edges, yes, nice. And again, it's like right, Stormcast, Eternal Warhammer, and the symbols of the mortal realms are detailed in gold foil, and the pages have gold gilt edges. Oh, that that, that looks like a book that would be a pleasure to hold. Hmm. Yeah. And lick, pleasure to lick. I will have to bow to. Oh, I see what you mean about the magnetically sealed box. It's um, like a A4 box file, but it's got an extra uh, lip on it, which will presumably have the magnet inside to make it shut yes. properly. Mm. Yes, and nice pictures on the front. There are pictures on the front. Yeah, no, really it looks pictures. like a. Oh, excuse me. Wow, a hundred quid. But that's not all of the Cubicle Seven news. All of the Age of Sigma news, even. Yes. There's more Age of Sigma news. Yes. More Age of Sigma news. Yeah, you My can, you mind can pick is it up. blown. It's blown you can as we speak. Pick it up right now. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Age of Sigma, soulbound. It's available. You can buy it. Oh, okay. Yes, you can get your digital edition, or you could get. Yes, you can edition. get the PDF. So you can um, pre-order the hardcover, yeah. and you can buy right now yes. the PDF. And if you pre-order the hardcover, of course, you also get the PDF for free with it because nice. that's just how it should work and how it does work. Yeah. For the majority of RPG publishers out there, they're very happy to work with the bricks and mortar scheme or just do it themselves and straight up give you a yeah. PDF if you buy a yeah. physical copy of their work, which is pretty sweet. Yeah. That's not the only thing, though, because uh, there's, four other, there's four other things you can pre-order, not four just the core rulebook. So one of, the, one of the four other things yes. is... 
Yes. That collector's edition we just talked about. That's you not another that thing. But okay. Yes. Oh, another thing as well as the core rule book. Oh, I see. Right, the core rule book, collector's edition. The GM screen. Nice, nice. The map of the Great Parch. I, I find GM screens less useful now because, like, people can't really see me through the webcam because the screen's in the way. So I try to u- not use a web GM screen nowadays. Yeah, but the lockdown won't last forever. Yeah, that's right. Or okay. maybe it will. It just feels like it. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's the fourth one? A map of the Great Parch. And the fourth thing is, yes. is it, yes. can you guess? Can you guess? Is it a PDF on the GM screen? <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a physical thing. Oh, a physical thing. Um, is it an adventure? No. Oh. Um, is it some dice? Uh, is it a dice related, tower? Related is it a dice tower to... shaped in the shape of a cursed tower, which uh, you can throw your dice you're, at the top? You're circling, it, you're circling it, you're circling it, you're circling it, you're ah, circling it. You're circling the brain, like this podcast has been for the last yes, nine episodes. You're, you're, you're in the accretion <laughs> disc of the black hole, but you haven't quite Ooh. crossed the event horizon yet. Spaghettification awaits. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so it's not, is it a source book? No, should I tell you? I think you should. Should I end the suspense? Hey, Russ. <laughs> Uh, here's a little joke for you. How, how do you keep an idiot in suspense? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> anyway, go get on with it. Oh dear. Uh, it's a dice tray. <gasps> a dice tray? A dice tray. <laughs> just what I always wanted. <laughs> just, just in case you're just wondering, what on earth is a dice tray? Essentially, if you have like a piece of leather, it... Um, can roll up that way, but also it's got some studs, and you fold the studs together and click them, and that forms four corners, and then you have like a portable tray that you can take along and roll your dice in. The idea being that your dice do not then, has, inev- has inevitably happens, roll from your hand to the table, off the table, under the sofa, they're there to become a toy of your cat forevermore. And of course, the reason why you might want to buy such a thing is this one does have um, a picture which I think is from the core rule book, if I, unless if my eyes are not deceiving me. Or the Sounds Paladin, like the sort of thing it would have, yeah. Yeah, leaping down and doing some sort of smite. I say Paladin doing a smite, but neither of those things apply, because this is not D&D. You can still smite. You can still smite something. Yeah. Smite's a real word. Yeah. D&D hasn't co-opted the word. D&D doesn't know, own the, the word Paladin smite. smiting stuff, and that's pretty specific in meaning. <laughs> so there are champions smiting something. Oh, no, that's Pathfinder. Anyway, we digress. Yes. Okay, let's do some more news. Yeah, let's do some more news. Exciting Would you stuff. like to know what the most popular fighter subclasses are in d and I think the champion is very popular. You are correct. Yeah. So D&D Beyond yes. has done one of its frequent data shares mm-hmm. and has given us the top 10 yeah. um, most popular subclasses all fighters in D and D. How many subclasses are there? There can't be more than about ten, anyway, are there? There's three, six, nine, eleven. So if there's eleven, they've just like left one off. I, uh, yeah, I'm just just doing it off the top of my head because you've got three in the core book. You've got three in Xanathar's. Yeah, they got purple dragon knight, which is just so bad. In Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, there you got, I think, two from Matt Mercer's stuff Echo Knight and Gunslinger. Uh, neither of those two are on this. Oh, okay. I will say that. Oh, no, one of them is. Oh, they are both on there. I'm, li- I'm a big fat liar. They are, are both on there. Hang on. I am so. such a liar. But I'm still only getting things like nine, I think, unless they're counting in Earth Arcana. So, who's the most popular know. fighter subclass? You know. You know what the most fighter, popular fighter subclass is. Is it champion? Okay. Of course yeah. it's champion, yes. Well, well, 38, like it's, 38.1% of people. It, it's like, it's not the best subclass, but it's a very reliable one. The, the just, stick being... It's just it, the basic fighter, and it? It's well, we're crits on the nine team, and mm. actually, that's that's sort of a big deal sometimes. It's basically, it, a, flight, it's basically a fighter with no extra flavour, really. It's just your core... Basic fighter. Yeah, uh, and it, it improves over time. I think the mm. fighters, like martial classes in general, have been very badly served by 5th edition. Um, I've actually decided to dip champion for one of my characters because I have a rogue. And we're coming up to the end of the adventure. I'm like, well, 
I'll, I'll, I'll go play and if I get a crit with my usually having advantage, I'll be rolling 14 dice plus 4, 14d6 plus 14, or no, 14d6 plus 17, which is a good number to be rolling. That's the sort of thing that would make a crit very exciting for me. I won't actually have a big handful of dice unless I get to play offline, but yeah, still good numbers. Okay. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, and battle masters are they? How, how are they doing? They're quite good. Number two, battle master, seventeen point four percent. Very, very exciting. Good maneuvers. Then just cross to the got, bottom. Then, but it should be purple dragon knight because they're just You're correct. Yes, one point one percent of people. One point one percent of people still did choose it though. That's amazing to me because. And when you think about it, one point one percent of D and D players. It's a huge. Huge number. There's supposed to be 40 million DMBD players at the moment. What's 1.1%? Oh. oh, no, it's f- fighter players, though, isn't it? It's not all DMB hey, players. Hey, what you say? <laughs> yeah, so it, it, we're, I can't, still, do, I can't do that. We're still talking, like, thousands of people. A lot, um, a lot of people have chosen Purple Dragon Knight, but, yeah. But, but, but people are, like, saying, oh, well, it's just Peter being really picky. But honestly, like no, you're right. it's, which is regard has, yeah. has the worst of the existing published subclasses because everyone forgets about the Purple Dragon Knight, it crits on a 19 or 20, which is pretty good, right? That's always on. The Purple Dragon Knight, when it uses the bonus action second wind, can restore some hit points to some of its colleagues. And that's its entirety of its further feature. And do you know what the other big problem with the Purple Dragon Knight is? Only applies to the Forgotten Realms, Sword Coast? It's, it's called the Purple Dragon Knight. Oh, I, I see, yes. <laughs> but Purple Dragon Bishop, but yeah, that would be it. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Skrull uh, so, Should I, should I, should I okay. give you all 10 quickly? Spells. Yes, go on. And number okay. one. Champion, number yeah. one. Number two. Battle Master. Woohoo. Stabby, stabby. Number three, Eldritch Knight. Yeah, cast some spells. Number four is the Gunslinger. Pew, pew. Interesting. Number yes. five is the Samurai. Ah, yeah, yeah. Always get advantage. Number six is the Arcane Archer. Yeah, twang. Number seven is a cavalier. Oh, okay. Bit surprised by that. I thought it would be better than an arcane archer, but no. Number eight is the rune knight. Oh, yes, that's new. Number Isn't that, nine is the echo knight. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, Matt Mercer's. And number ten is the purple dragon knight. Okay. Huh. There's well, four of them. Four out of ten classes are knights. And the cavalier is kind of a knight as well, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, so, they're... so is a samurai, really. Yeah, well, Samurai would be Servant. Which so six out of ten of them are Knights. We've got, yeah. we got six Knights, an Archer, a Gunslinger. A Battlemaster. And, yeah. Would you count a Champion uh, as a Knight? Well, I suppose it'd be no, position. Just a, oh, just yeah. A, they were just really good. Yeah. Pinnacles anyway. of Martial Prowess. prowess. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Well, that was exciting. Yeah. <laughs> be hey, exciting roll 20. Like yes? Roll 20 released some stats. Did it? Mm. Is business up? Shocker. Oh, I know, right? So basically, there's growth everywhere, according to them. Yes. So these are from quarter one 2020, and okay. there isn't a lot of change in the relative rankings of different games since 2019. Yeah. So they're, you know, the list is fairly so, similar in the same order with the same percentages. Yeah, rough, but, rough options, yeah. But basically, they're saying nearly everything has doubled. Wow. Okay. That's... Quite it's not unsurprising. Yeah, it's not no, unsurprising, no. though. You'd expect yeah. a, a massive, massive... I mean, there's been a little bit of shift. Like, uh, you, you you remember D&D had dropped a bit. It's climbed yeah. back up a little bit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Call of Cthulhu's still in second place ahead of Pathfinder, and it has been for, like, two, two or three yeah, quarters now. But it's like, you have to look at medium. Roll20 is really good. I'm actually a subscriber to Roll20. I've paid mm. actual money to use its services. But that's because I really like quite like running D and D. It's it's fun. I'm having mm. you know people tell me it's a good time, so I'm inclined to run more. But if you're running a game like Call of Cthulhu, maybe even Savage Worlds or something more role play heavy, then mm. what do you actually get from Roll Twenty apart from like a map? As you've established, you can run Pathfinder and so forth quite happily, just using. Sharing screens and sketching. Yeah, them we're out. literally just using Zoom and a shared whiteboard, and that's it. Yeah, we don't need yeah. anything else. And um, yeah, so why, why, and that's so. If you've got a less tactical game, 
then yeah, you'd be entirely happy using Roll20 or not using Roll20. Like I've done Skype games like Death Watch, had an excellent game for that about, about six, seven years ago, where it was all like on Skype, no video, um, mm. and there was a map we were looking at, and then we were just narrating what happened and uh, running what the GM said, and they'd occasionally mm. post an updated map. So yeah, Roll20 is very nice, but not essential. But I could see it definitely being a lot more useful for uh, Dungeons and Dragons, especially Fifth Edition. Hey, uh, you know Joe Manganiello? 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 Man- Manganiello? How many more times do you want to say that poor man's name? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. Anyway, Manganiello. Him. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. He uh, was interviewed by Variety. Yes. The entertainment magazine. And they went round to his house. Oh. When he had his regular D&D game on. Right. Okay. Uh, which takes place in his basement. And the players are yes. Vince Vaughan. Okay. Right. Um, the Rage Against the Machine guitarist, Tom Morello. Nice. Uh, nice. The wrestler, Paul the Big Show White. I'm less familiar with this person than the first two, <laughs> but okay. Uh, game of Thrones co-creator, D.B. Weiss. Ah, uh, okay, yep. Ah, uh, and uh, what we got? He got his brother Nick, writer John C- uh, Castle, fanboys director Carl Newman, League oh. of Legends story designer Ryan Vernier, CrossFit mm. Masters champion Ron Mathis. Wow, how many players is that? That's like eight or something like that. That's quite a few, yeah. Yeah, well, that's a big group. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, but it's, but, it's quite an interesting article. I mean, I, yeah, like I'm looking at the pictures at the moment and the sets and scenery and, you know, they've got 3D tiles and just uh, I, an I entire imagine, basement themed around D&D. It's, like, incredible. I, I imagine if you have some commercial success, they can afford to say, eh, well, why not? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, oh. does, look, it does look pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm mildly jealous. Uh, Altered Carbon. Altered Carbon, yes. The RPG has come out. I think season uh, it hasn't come out. Tomorrow? Oh, uh, the RPG it's not. hasn't come out. Oh, uh, oh. But, but you can that? you can pre order it. You can pre order the Altered Carbon RPG. Yes. It comes out in September. Mm, okay. Uh, and not just that, there's a limited edition version, mm. which looks rather lovely with a metallic looking slipcase. I assume the slipcase isn't actually metal, but the picture looks metal. Okay. Um, the limited edition is like $90 as opposed to $50 for the regular edition. Mm. And there's a GM screen as well, which you can also pick up. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I had the... They had a Kickstarter or something, haven't they? Did they have a uh, Kickstarter? Well, there's an Altered Carbon, the role-playing game Kickstarter, I can see. Oh, in that case, yes, they did then. Yeah. Renegade Game but, Studios, this is. Yeah, they've got an, yeah, they've got an estimated delivery of August 2020. So, yeah. 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 Well, it looks like it's coming in at September, but yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah, it didn't. Oh wow, that did pretty well. Three hundred and seventy-two five four seven mm. of a twenty thousand goal. So yeah, very nice, very, very nice indeed. Good work. Good very work. nice indeed. That's yeah, it. yeah. Uh, right. What else have we got? Let's have a look. Dungeons and Dragons live action movie. Haven't mentioned that in a while, have we? Well, no, it came out years ago with Jeremy Irons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, it's, it's it's all let's, right, but I didn't feel the, I didn't think it was really news per se. Less, less said about that, the better. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, there's a new one, isn't there? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, um, I, 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 I'm really not an expert on filmmaking terminology, however. Um, Marvel Studios executive producer Jeremy Latcham is now mm-hmm. attached to it. Okay, right. Uh, and apparently this is a good thing. Yes, yes. Uh, somebody associated with producing the Marvel movies, which have enjoyed some small success. Yeah. So he he was executive years. producer on Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Um, the Avengers. Yeah. Spider-Man Homecoming. Which were really good. So, yeah, like a producer sort of makes things happen so that the movie can happen. Mm-hmm. 
basically. Uh, um, screenwriters Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly, who wrote Spider-Man Homecoming, are still attached to write and direct. Strong. Strong choice. Uh, I quite enjoyed Homecoming myself. Yeah. I mean, there's been so much over the last like three or four years. There's been so many different reports of various people being attached to it and then not being attached mm-hmm. to it and different writers and then a different director and then a different this and then a different that. The I kind of just got a bit lost track mm-hmm. of it, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like one of those things. If they get a good editor and they have sufficient footage... I mean, we, we, we ourselves are living proof of what happens if you have an excellent editor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... There was some bad news coming from Kickstarter. Bad news coming from Kickstarter? Very bad news coming from Kickstarter. Very bad news? Tell me. Kickstarter's laying off up to 45% of its workforce. Wow, that is a lot of people. That is a lot. Uh, apparently there's yeah. been a 35% drop in projects on the platform. 35% drop, that is... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But mainly, mainly due to the pandemic, everyone's basically assuming... Because, I mean, I've got, I've got a Kickstarter that's, you know... All set up, ready Been approved by Kickstarter that I haven't yeah. launched yet, because I... Well, partly because I'm not quite ready to launch it, but even if I was, I don't yeah. think I... don't think I'd be launching like it right, right now. Yeah. yeah. But then, Luke Crane, mm-hmm. who uh, handles the tabletop games um, department, one word, whatever, uh, at yeah. Kickstarter... Yeah. And is also the author of Torchbearer. Oh, okay. Has just launched a talk. Well, not just launched. It's coming to an end now. The Torchbearer Second Edition Kickstarter. So he oh, okay. had confidence in it. Yeah, yeah. But to be fair, it does also have a massive following. Yes. Yeah, yeah there is that. Like people yeah. just taking a punt, uh, like Tim Gonzalez of Pirate Gonzalez Games. Uh, I think is what about week two, and it's about halfway to the goal. Uh, I mentioned him because uh, I've been following that Kickstarter because mm. uh, uh, I was so I was so interested in it. Uh, Ancestry's awakened. Oof. Uh, mm. I'll just quick check. Well, Egg Embry had a quick word with Luke Crane. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, ah, here we go. Here's his title: Head of Outreach and International. Mm. Okay. Okay, uh, so um, again, we had a quick word. So he asked, uh, in your role at Kickstarter and having a better idea than most because of that position, how would you describe the RPG Kickstarter market during the pandemic? Mm-hmm. And Luke replied, uh, the stats show there was a brief wobble in the games category in March, but okay. we've since recovered and begun to climb back into it. Uh, the twin launches of Torchbearer and Deadlands have both been very positive with $500 mm. in pledges between them. Okay, so big existing brands that are well known. Yeah, two big but, ones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Torchbearer is that is that really well known? Do we think? Because I hadn't really heard of it until. Oh, uh, I heard of it. Uh, you heard of it? Yeah, okay. I think, I think it's. Yeah, yeah it's not. I don't know if it's super yeah. famous, but it's definitely known. Good, 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 good following. I hear it's like quite good yeah, for yeah. Um, getting into the sort of the simulationist nitty gritty detail, but I could be completely wrong. It's I know kind of, I look, probably am. But. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that's what it is. All right, fair enough. Uh, Egg did ask Luke, uh, why, why did they launch the Torchbearer second edition Kickstarter right now? Uh-huh. And he said uh, they've been planning since February on launching it in the spring. Yeah. And uh, as the pandemic grip tightened, um, they became more determined to launch, not less, because they wanted to stand up and show that they were still making games and plant a flag and say, I know things suck, but games are still important. Mm. Yeah, games are still important. I mean, I think role-playing games have been absolutely essential for many people. It gives you some structure to your week when, for a lot of people, your day looks very, very similar and has yeah. very little variety to it. it and unlike a lot of activities, it is something you can easily do online. Very easily do online. Very There's easily plenty do of online. activities you can't do online. But uh, is one you definitely can. Absolutely. And you can but do so it at different at, times as well. Yeah. Well, looking at Kickstarter, these are, these are some of the projects that are currently on there at the moment. So we've got mm-hmm. Torchbearer 2nd Edition, one week to go. It's yep. done about a quarter of a million dollars. Of a £36,000... Oh, $45,000 goal. Yeah. So I, was, I, I, I see it in pounds when I look it up. 196000 or £36,000. That's mm-hmm. very impressive. 
It does say it's a role-playing game of desperate survival, so perhaps I'm not entirely off. Oh, it's Burning Wheel. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Two train books for the new Dungeon Craft series. Hundreds of terrain pieces for use in your home game. The cardboard pieces. Nice, nice. Uh, which is doing very well. $270,000. One week to go. Uh, we've got an what NPC portraits deck, which is adventurers, townsfolk, and hirelings. Uh, oh, again, yeah. one week to go. Done very well. $11,000. We've got the Dragon Fighters Advanced Musha Shugyo RPG. Okay, I presume that is some sort of manga, possibly anime title. Um, okay, the fighting board game that feels like an arcade console. Dragon Fighters is a board game, a role-playing game, a card game, and much more. You can play Dragon Fighters in many different game modes, such as solo, with your friends, as a simple board game, or storytelling your amazing adventures. Okay. Okay. Uh, Looking at the picture, it's got lots of cards and lots of accessories and lots of bits and pieces. Um, I assume it's very big in Italy because it's all bilingual, English and Italian. It also hasn't funded yet. It also hasn't funded yet. It's got uh, a week to go, and yeah. it's only done three and a half thousand out of five thousand. It'll, I think it'll yeah, find just about. That's yeah. doable. Yeah, like it's, yeah. it's still got the last last week to go. Get a big yeah. b- bumper there. Uh, yeah. sort of like, well, we've got Valor the Beast Heart, which is a Viking inspired RPG story game. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had a massive funding goal of one hundred dollars, <laughs> and it's funded. Really. Mate, uh, so it, it starts with, it said, well, with like $100,000. And people are like, No, $100. Yeah, okay. Oh, $100. $100. Right. <laughs> I, was, I thought you said $100,000. And I'm like, wow, that is, that is, that is a big ass. Well done, Sam. No, $100. $100 is a lot more reasonable, to be fair. Uh, Grimsgate, Frog God Games. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition and Pathfinder 1st Edition. Nice, nice. And it's a low-level adventure. Yeah. Don't know anything okay. else about it. <laughs> let, me, oh, let me open it up. <laughs> let me open it up. <laughs> it's just the eggs column there. It doesn't actually say anything about it. Um, here we go. Uh, deep in the wooded wilderness, the village of Grimsgate is an outpost town on a seldom travel trail on the edge of nowhere. It's a half-ruined temple of law, dilapidated inn, a drunken blacksmith, an exiled trader. The woods have become dangerous. What... Great, evil, and fabulous treasures are to be found in these lands. Okay. I that I mean, i got to say that sounds a lot like a lot of RPGs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, if, we, if we did a special, guess, guess what the Kickstarter, guess what the name of the Kickstarter is, or guess what the Kickstarter, which system the Kickstarter is about, from just the description alone, that would be a much harder game. I wouldn't be able to play that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, oh... <laughs> Uh, and there's one more Kids and Dragons it's an Italian game nice and is this like Kids on Bikes but they're riding dragons I don't know because it's in Italian Kids and Dragons e per la famiglia la scuola o gli amici please 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 stop I don't know what it's about Um, but um, it's done it's funded it's done nearly 24 grand out of 8,000 with 12 days to go okay but it is completely in Italian, including the including the product page. So I can't really tell you anything about it. Uh, uh, I thought I'd found the web page. Except that the title the title is Kids and Dragons, which is English. And if you follow that, will lead you to Bearded Dragon Breeders, just outside of San Antonio, Texas. They have some like you know quite impressive pictures of big bearded dragons. Hey, and also no, advice on no, bearded dragon care. No, that's there's no. What are you talking about? No, I'm saying I'm saying if I if I Google it, that's what comes up. Let me try Kids and Dragons RPG and see if this... Oh, right, helps. okay. I was going to say what you were talking about there. No, I've got Kids and Dragons RPG is how to introduce your kids to Dungeons and Dragons. Try looking on Kickstarter. Uh, That's where it is. Yeah, I can't find any anything on Kickstarter. You've just like read out a whole bunch of um, uh, titles and I, I, I couldn't find Gink, Grimsgate or anything like that. It was like ridiculous. Just look at X column. Um, He's got links to them all of them. I know. That's the easiest way. That's the easiest way to do it. I suppose we could. Finally, it is ready. 
Dear friend Fantastico, I have completed my new spell, my magnum opus, the pinnacle of my career. Well, that's wonderful, Comrade Marvello. I am agog with excitement. It is not often that we see a new spell. Indeed, indeed, Fantastico, my wizardly compatriot. And this, I feel, is truly a masterpiece. It will be the spell of choice for countless generations of magi as they penetrate the deepest dungeons and battle the most maleficent monsters. Ah, you've been working on this spell for nearly a decade, Marvello, my brother in the arcane arts. You speak truth, my scholarly cohort. But after years of clinical trials, where I carefully catalogued the safety issues and potential side effects, and calculated the spell's efficacy, I have managed to get the spell approved by the Arcane Approval Administration. Excellent news, Marvello, my conjurer in arms. And what, pray tell, does this wondrous magical feat of miraculous evocation do? It is truly a sight to behold. I animate my arms thusly, ah. and speak the mysterious syllables of enchantment aloud, and from my outstretched fingertips shall spring forth not one, not two, but three glowing ah. darts of pure sorceress energy which speed handily and with absolute accuracy to strike my target wheresoever it may be as long as it's within nine of sight and within twenty feet why marvella that's a truly fantastic spell it will no doubt become a staple of any budding evoker's occult armament and make you famous beyond your wildest dreams in truth sir I envy you. Thank you, friend Fantastico. Your words mean much to me. Of course. You have to market it right. Never fear, my miraculous thaumaturge. I have the perfect name for my extraordinarily new feat of magical legend domain. Pray, tell me, my wish-like peer, what name have you given this otherworldly conjuration? It is a name which will evoke wonder, mystery, and power. It shall echo down through the ages, its syllables dripping with glittering magnificence and sublime spectacle. The lips of apprentices shall tremble as they utter its title. I cannot wait any longer, my enchanting colleague. Please, tell him his name. Very well, my dear accomplice. I have named this spell... Yes? It shall be known as... Yes? Magic Missile. Sorry, what? You heard me. My spell, the pinnacle of my career, a work of art that will reverberate down through the ages, will be known as... Magic Missile. I, I must say, friend Marvello... I am a little underwhelmed. Underwhelmed? How can you speak this way of the greatest magical achievement of our generation? Oh, the spell is fine, 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 fine. It's just the branding. The branding? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Magic missile. I just can't see it catching on. Well, it has alliteration. Yes, I suppose. And it trips off the tongue. Also true. But don't you think it's a bit... bland? Bland, my effervescent associate? Yeah, it lacks... flair. Flair? Yes, flair. Magic missile. It just kind of... says what it is. I mean, it's not inaccurate. Indeed. It does what it says on the tin. Comes the tin? A figure of speech. It's a little like calling the mighty RMS Coltong Floating Vessel 17, or the Dread Palace of Infinite Doom, northernmost symmetrical stone pile. Yes, I suppose so. Well, what do you suggest, my erstwhile advisor? Have you considered 
including your name? Something like Marvello's Marvelous Magical Missiles. I mean, that's not perfect, but it has a certain grandiosity that Magic Missile lacks. I suppose that does sound better. Very well, very well. Marvelous, marvelous, magical missiles it is. Right now, by my next spell, I call this one Create Food and Water. Ugh, I give up. And we still don't have a topic. <laughs> Old. I haven't got anything. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, well, um, you know, like, let's stuff. talk about what you know. Where do most new RPG books come from? Do people just write a book and say, I've created a book and it happens? Or do people come to you and say, I've got this idea for a book? Do you commission it? Or do you say, I need someone to write a book? Uh, generally speaking, yeah, it's publisher led. I don't think. I can't think of a situation where someone's come to me and said, I want to write this book. Oh, no, that's no, I'm lying completely. Why not came to me with... That, that happened, like, two weeks ago. Did it? Yeah. I said, I want to write this book. <laughs> anyway. No, but I mean, f- no, but for me. Yeah, oh, for you. Right, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, no, but then Ryan Knock, Ooh. when he did War of the Burn and Sky and Zeitgeist, that's what happened. Mm. He came to me, I said, I've got okay. these ideas for adventure paths, I want to write them. But generally speaking, mm-hmm. it's the other way around. So the publisher will say, right, we want this book. Now we're going to look yep. for freelancers to do the various tasks. So oh, okay. then we'll look for artists, we'll look for writers, we'll look for this, look for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, generally it works the other way around. That's not saying it doesn't happen. People do no, no. pitch things to, 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 to publishers. But certainly yeah. from my point of view, that's that's tends to be the way around it goes mm, mm, mm. okay but how do you, have, do you do you advertise that you look for people or do you have like a stable of authors that you've worked with before oh. it's a mix yeah it's a mix i mean you know i've been doing this for quite a long time mm-hmm. so i know quite a lot of people so i'll reach out to people that i think will be suitable for it and see if they're available is this people you've worked with before or people that you really like their stuff yeah yes yeah well usually people i've worked with before mm-hmm. and that that's nice and easy. Otherwise, you can reach out to people yeah. that you know are good at that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. but they might be busy. Uh, mm-hmm. Or or you put out an ad of some kind, if you have to, which I don't like doing a so much, because you end up with you know, a great big, long, a, a lot of entries, mm-hmm. and you have to you have to sort through them all and all that sort of stuff, and that's that process isn't much fun. No, I can imagine it's like, because you get, what, hundreds of responses? No, it depends on what it is. Yeah, yeah. For, for some things you will, yeah. For other things you'll probably get, you know, a few yeah. dozen. Yeah. Depends where, on what it is. Where would you even advertise that? Because I don't... I mean, Insider is obviously on ma- hobby magazine, a mm. e-zine that I'm aware of. I guess Dragon magazine? Would that be another? I'm really just trying there to say. There isn't a Dragon magazine. Sorry? There isn't a Dragon magazine. No. Um, what's his face was in... Something. I'm sure I read an article with he, him in. The new new head of D&D. Oh, you're thinking of Dragon Plus, which is... Yes. Yeah, but that's very much Wizard of the Coast house organ. You can't... Mm-hmm. So you, you can't write for it. No. Uh, oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, where... where, 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 where how do you find out about getting into RPGs? Uh, do you just have to be on the internet, or you have to know people at conventions? I'm just wondering uh, well, how you get into it. I'm not... Like yeah, I myself. think probably the internet is probably the first, is, is probably the most important thing. Mm-hmm. So generally speaking, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's networking really. So basically yeah. you'll, you'll become known to the publisher probably because you have to be, say you wanted to write for What's Always New, for example. Yeah, yeah. Because I happen to be the publisher of that. Yeah, so. but that's a nice, easy example. So you can speak with some yeah, authority. Yeah. <laughs> or, or Judge Dredd or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... If it's a complete stranger out of the blue, yeah, that's a that's a lot more difficult from my point of view because I don't know who that person is. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it's someone who's kind of made themselves known and I know that they're a fan, yes, then that's yeah. that's that's a little easier an intro point. I was listening to a podcast oh, yeah. and it had Cat Tobin on it from um, Pegwain Press, 
Yeah. And she was talking about how people would come up to her at conventions mm -hmm. and say that they want to write for Power Game Press. Right. And she'd say to them, oh, great, that's fantastic. Which of our game lines is it? Which is your favourite? Yeah. Which is Which is the one that you've... Uh, which you've run the most. And yeah. they'll go, oh, no, I haven't actually run run any of these games. Oh. And she's like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, which one which one have you played the most? Which which, which of our, which of Pearl Green Press's game lines yeah. have you played the most? And they're like, well, I haven't actually really, really played any of them. And then she's like, right, okay. So why, 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 why are you asking what, me? <laughs> what, what, what is it that you, you, that you're familiar with? And they go, yeah. oh, well, I'm, 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 I'm very, very familiar with fate. And she's like, Right, maybe you should wander over to Evil Hacks booth. Over yeah. there, you know, it's... <laughs> Scoot on down. down, down the line. <laughs> and talk to people who actually produce the fake stuff. <laughs> Might be an idea. So yeah, yeah you got to be someone who A, is a fan of the stuff that, that they already produce. Pitching that you're right for. Yeah. Like that, and B, clearly knows that stuff. Like producers, sorry, publishers tend to have like sort of I get the impression, and I could well be wrong, just from looking outside, not being an industry professional, as I am not, that mm -hmm. publishers tend to have, like, sort of almost a house system. Like, I'm not sure if that's completely yeah. correct. But like, yeah, most do. I mean, yeah. not all do, but most do. Yeah, yeah. So, like, Modifius has, like, its role 2D20. 20 20 yeah. the, the Genesis yeah. system was with Fantasy Flight, and obviously... Yeah. Pale uh, Grain has Gumshoe. Yes, yes. Wizard well, of the well, Coast has D and D, obviously. Um, well, yeah, yeah g generally speaking, yeah. yeah. Because um, I think most publishers don't just want to only be yeah. producing supplements for someone else's game. They yeah. kind of want to, you know, have a, a bit more creative yeah. direction than that, and have their own their own IP and their own thing that they can, you know, yeah. and play also, with to their heart's content. And also, it makes it easier to sort of like judge the quality of the work, really, doesn't it? Because if you know, for you especially, it's much easier because you wrote what's old is new. So mm -hmm. if someone sends you stuff and you're like looking at these, you're like, "Oh, these these are these are not good numbers," then you'll be able to mm. talk about the mechanical balance. Yeah, I mean, I I have received manuscripts from people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just like the terminology they use and things like that, it's like, right, you've actually written this for a different game, right? And then they sort of like <laughs> scrubbed it off a bit and sent it to you in a sort of generic fashion. Either that, or they're obviously not that familiar with this game system, and they're very familiar with another one, and that colours the way they write it. And it's and you read it, and it's like mm. this is clearly mm. uh, you know D and D, yeah, so from the terminology you're using, you right, know that's right, right. yeah, yeah it's, it's it's got the wrong. It's not speaking the same language. It's not using language, the mechanical yeah. terms. So mm. actually, it's it's actually a bit more complicated to write an RPG system or RPG supplement. They might think. Because you have to really know the system, and you have to write well. Is that mm. fair? Yeah, I mean, some some oh. systems are stricter than others. Like if you want to write for Paizo, that's yeah. a lot more difficult because mm. they have very very strict things about these words have to be italicized, these are capitalized, yeah. these are not, these are yeah. formatted in this way, and all that. And you've got to know all that stuff. You've got to know mm. that magic items are all lowercase italic. Yeah. You have to know, you know, yeah. how feats are and ability scores and other systems aren't quite as strict as that yeah but, but that, that's so sort of, it depends that, that's a sort of a style guide issue which is common yeah, to yeah, all yeah. publishing that they all have style guides which says you have to do thus and so in order for us to yeah. consider it yeah and that's kind of, that's yeah and that's kind of like instruction number one you have to follow the style guide because if you can't do well, that then you're if you giving can't follow the editor, basic written instructions well also, also you're, just, you're just giving adding a massive editing overhead where people are literally picking through your manuscript word by word right. and starting and, you know, and making and changing them, which is when you, when you're at that point, that person might, the editor might as well be just writing it. Yeah. If they're, okay. if they're editing to that degree. That, that's that's really, they're not like looking for mistakes. They're basically looking to correct the whole thing and almost mm. rewrite it. Yeah. That's, that's a massive, massive load of things. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. So, so so, so the style guide is always important. No, no, I, I hadn't really considered that in that light, but yeah. Um, and, so and you, that also comes comes across just from being familiar with the system. And if you're really, yeah. really familiar with D and D, you know how they format stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then oh, when okay. you come to write it, you you're able to kind of naturally write in that that language. Yeah. Okay. But you've got to be aware that other games have a different language. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. So yeah, it, no matter what system you're writing for, it's good to be familiar with. Not just the mechanics, but also the 
Is, is this not like the trade dress, like the way they put things? Or am I getting that term? Kind of. Trade dress is more um, graphical elements, generally. Oh, okay. So, so like the, the trade dress of a and d book, you, right. you can see a and d stat block, and you can recognise it's a and d stat block just by glancing yeah. at it. Oh, okay. You know, it's got like the of, red lines and... And the beige and sort of parchmenty background. And, you know, that's that's his trade dress. Like it's torn from a book, sort of page yeah. bits around the side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's his trade dress. And technically, you're not supposed to copy that. No, technically. If it's made to look like it's a D&D book, yeah. so that someone might glance at it and think, oh, that comes from Wizard of the Coast. Oh, that then is... by definition, you're copying their trade dress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's and like... the whole point of trade dress is to distinguish your work yes. from someone else's. So, so to make... Oh, okay, so that makes sense. So the more it looks like... A D and D book, but not published by Wizards of the Coast. If you post, if you published on DM's Guild, you can. Right. Uh, DM's Guild has its own rules. Yes. But uh, if you publish it anywhere but on DM's Guild, you can't copy the trade dress. With you, with you, okay. But okay. a lot, but a lot of people do, and yeah. it doesn't seem to be policed in any way. So <laughs> okay, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but we don't. No, no, that's it. That's interesting. Okay, so. Um, and what sort of level of finished do you like to see books at if people are bringing your presentation? From my point of view, I know if someone says, I've got this idea for a game, or I've got this idea for a book, I'm like, hmm, hmm, that's nice, cool. Go write it and then come back to me and talk to me about it then. Uh, yeah, no. I mean, someone can't just come up to me with a book and just hand it to me and expect me to read it and then mm-hmm. say yes or no. That's not going to yeah. happen. And okay. also, if I did that, it's like, you know, like movie scripts. Yeah, yeah. You, people won't read them unsolicited because if that yeah. same idea appears in a later movie, yes. people will claim that you stole their idea. With you, yeah. Okay. So you've got to be careful about that. But, so uh, basically, un- unsolicited pitches are a little awkward. Yeah. On yeah. that front. Right, right. Uh, yeah. And as you say, ideas are a dime a dozen. Yeah. So yeah. come down the pub with me for an hour and we'll come up with 40 ideas. They're too easy. Anyone can come up with ideas. Yes. Just like that. It's turning ideas into work, into, mm, into books. An into actual hard. product, yeah. So, yeah. so you don't want a finished book, but you, you need more than an idea. What sort of level of... So I would say the ideal thing... So say, say someone's pitching to me. Yeah. And we're going with the scenario that they, they're pitching a brand new book that I'm not commissioning for. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's just, Right, okay. So what I would want then, probably an email... Yeah. Introducing themselves, uh-huh. giving me a say, one paragraph max description yeah. of what the book is. Yeah, so yeah. Like the sort of elevator pitch sort of thing. Yeah, and some indication of why they're qualified to write that. Mm-hmm. Even if that qualification is just, you know, I've been running a What's Old is New game for three years. Yeah, yeah. At least that tells me something. That gives me some information. Yeah. It tells me it's not just someone sending this paragraph out to every publisher. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it says that they've actually got some sort of experience of using the system. Yeah. Uh, even if it's like, I mean, it might even be 120 sessions, which is around about 360 hours of talking with and using your system. Mm. Uh, that's like the bare minimum. That's just the session time. So they yeah, probably spent yeah. more than that. So that's, you know, reassuring for you. But you don't you don't want them to have finished it and have done all the editing. Well, they can have finished it. They just don't just don't send me the finished book. Oh, okay. And, so you and, need unless I commission like... it, right? <laughs> and then <laughs> if I commission it, I commission a number of words. Yeah, because yeah, oh, that's the established standard in the industry of how you pay for things. It's like produce this many number of words. Yeah. Well, the and, other well the other thing is because yeah. then you know how long how long the book is because oh. right. Say say I commission a I don't know a seventy five thousand word book from you. Right. I have no idea how big that is. It's reasonably large, but anyway, seventy five thousand words. If you if you send, then send me a fifty thousand word manuscript, mm. and twenty five thousand words short, that's right. a problem. That is. A problem. I've got to I've got to find twenty five thousand words. If you send me a hundred thousand page work manuscript, that is a big problem. You are not doing me a favour. No. Because I can't use 100,000 words because that's another 25,000 words that I've got to pay to illustrate, get Oof. laid out, yeah. print. You know, if I've budgeted the 75,000 words, I know how many pages that is. I know how much art I need for it. Right. I know how much it's going to cost me to print that. Yeah, yeah. Making it a quarter times larger <laughs> means it's gone beyond my budget. I can't do it. Right. So it becomes... And either I have to get an editor to trim your manuscript by 25,000 words... 
which which is costs me as well. Yeah, yeah, that also costs. So yeah, you got to you got to send the amount of words or as close to the amount of words as you can. Right, with you. That yeah. is important. You're not doing anyone a favour by sending extra words. I understand. Yeah, you're okay. just creating extra work and cost. That is that is that is. <laughs> so I'd yeah. So I would say an email, just pitching the idea. Yeah. In this industry, most yeah. writers are not yeah. full-time writers. No, they're no, hobbyists. No. There's, yeah. there's very few people, I think, that freelance full-time as writers. And I mean, you got people like there's very few um, fiction writers that are full-time. I mean, yeah, there's some yeah. that are like award-winning, like the guy that won the Clark Awards. I happen to know he works as a, a legal, uh, a, a legal attorney. So it's like his, yeah. his so, hobby yeah. is writing amazing fiction, but still yeah. got a day job. But for that reason, I'm not necessarily expecting you to be able to send in a CV full of mm. published a list of published works. No, no, that's crazy. Yeah. That's fine. I understand that people might not be able to do that, but they do have to sort of make me believe that they are going to be reliable, do the thing they said they're going to do yes. to a reasonable standard. Okay, okay. So It isn't going to involve a massive, massive amount of work once the manuscript arrives. Yeah, yeah. so things like the email itself having a good standard of written English is pretty important. Oh, absolutely, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, the other thing that will probably happen is mm-hmm. that person will probably get a much, much smaller assignment first mm-hmm. just to test the water, see if they write what they are asked to write. Yes, that's important. And do it to deadline. Right. So reliability, capability, and mm-hmm. punctuality are really key yeah. virtues. Is yeah, what yeah you're absolutely. For. I, mean, I guess a lot of that comes into reliability. Do what mm. you said you're going to do when yeah. you said you're going to do it. That yes. is, the, they're the really big key skills. Yeah. You can do if you master those two things. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you master reliability, you are well on your way. Yeah, those, those are really your hallmarks of professionalism. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, what about if people just have an idea? that they can work on, but it doesn't really fit within any set publisher. Like, if you've got an idea for, say, D&D, sending it to Wizards of the Coast, I imagine, probably won't go so well. They won't even look at it, no. <laughs> they have a nice round file for these ideas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, won't, they won't look at it. But, um, well, I yeah, mean, you can publish it yourself. Yeah. That's yeah. always one option. Right. Uh, and there's various ways of doing that. There's, like, what's it? drive through RPG, DMs Guild... Mm-hmm. Where you can use the actual trader, so it will look like an official D- Dungeons and Dragons product. Yeah, yeah. Kickstarter. You want to make loads of money off of it. Well, I mean, there are Kickstarter. We we have looked at quite a lot of Kickstarters, um, at least two or three per week. So it's probably looked about I don't know three, four hundred Kickstarters mm-hmm. over the course of this program. So it's it's a challenge. Yeah. So crowdfunding it has has the most potential for you, but it's not a guarantee by any means. No. no. Like obviously, what is an RPG book without art? Mm. Um, that's that's like it got to be its own sort of thing. I mean, do you get artists writing to you as well, asking for? Mm. Yeah, I mean, these days we've got an art director, Michael McCarthy, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and they write to him, uh, and yes. he's got a you know a few dozen artists that he works with regularly. Yeah, who yeah. Are, you know who he knows are reliable, who he, who you know demonstrated this. Do what you're going to do by the time you're going to say it. Yeah. And also, yeah. they know we're reliable because they know yeah. damn well that I sit down on the 15th of every month and do payroll, yeah. come what may. They know, And they know that yeah. happens, yeah. and they know that I'll do that, and they will get paid. And so, yeah. Yeah. Probably one of the things that is most exciting to many of our listeners will be things like world building, uh, creating mm-hmm. new worlds. Is that the sort of thing that you'd want stuff for? I mean... How how much use is a is a source book, or the or a the setting, like book? a setting? A book. setting. There we go. It's hard hard to say, really. I mean, mm. most publishers want their own IP. Yes. So they want to have a setting and a world of their own. Yes. Which they own and they can play with. It's their sandbox. And they can commission people come stuff to them all. for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So most people will want that. So you know, world building is definitely important to publishers. Mm. I mean, we. Uh, I'm, I'm. I'm sort of slowly building the soul space setting. Yes, for example, with the and Spartan the cauldron campus. setting. Yeah, yeah, and the cauldron setting, and, and a few mm. different, a few different settings, and we've got our zeitgeist setting and our war of the burning sky setting and things like yeah. that. And 
those things are important because otherwise yeah. you're operating in someone else's sandbox all the time. Yes. Mm. Which, which is, is fine. Is, yeah, which it's, is fine. It's doable. But, yeah. but it does it does limit limit your potential. Yeah. But if they pitch you an adventure within the soul space setting using what oh, that's fine. Know, oh yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. And that's yeah. that's probably the best thing. That's probably the best thing to do. That, that's actually a good foot in the door, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's probably the best sort of approach. You know. Mm. Pitch something smallish yeah, set yeah. within an existing setting mm. with an existing rule set that that publisher owns. That, I think, is probably what they're going to be most excited about. Yeah, but obviously these things need artwork. So would the publisher decide the artwork or would the writer decide the artwork? The publisher does. The publisher does. Yeah, there's sometimes um, a writer can put in art requests. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, uh, and they'll just, like, note, say, in, depending on the publisher's style guide, they might note in, like, red font, art request... Uh, a tall black man with uh, a large scimitar and mm. and riding a horse. I don't know, whatever. Yeah, um, but they probably. And use, I was like, like, yeah, that's basically the image I have in my head for this character. This, mm. this is kind of, but generally speaking, it's up to the publisher what actually gets commissioned. And then things like layout and so forth. That's not something you'd expect the writer to do. That's really more oh no no right here, right here just gives you a manuscript that's it just a manuscript straight just up. a manuscript yeah, yeah. a layout Cause... artist handles the layout mm-hmm. so totally, like... totally different do you know what layout artists really are like unsung heroes of this it's industry whenever you look at a book and you go yeah. oh my god that book's gorgeous mm-hmm. that book looks amazing mm-hmm. that book really gets the information across to me well you're probably mm-hmm. thinking you probably your mind probably goes to art, and you think mm. because it's got amazing art. Yeah, but what yeah. it also has is amazing layout. Okay, yeah. And the layout is, you know, it can really make or break so, a book. Then so important, so important. Yeah. Mm. I mean, basically, layout goes from one one end, like one, at one end of it, you've got a word, an unformatted word document. That's yes. Zero yeah. layout. Yeah, yeah. And then. At the other end, you've got like a D and D book with all these lovely images which fold into the text and the text curls mm. around them, and you've got borders and you've got stat blocks in those nice okay, um, yeah. parchment things with the red lines, and you've got nice title <laughs> fonts and yeah. smoky effects and all Ooh, that yeah, yeah. kind of stuff. Mm-mm. That is a hard to do. B, yeah. I think good layout artists are quite hard to come by. Right. They're, they're quite in demand. Really. Okay, yeah. so it's... I think I, I, don't, I don't think people realise quite how key layout artists are to to the industry. So well, important. I I had no idea about it. I'm learning right now. Uh, it's like all the things you said, I sort of knew, but I had no idea. Mm. So yeah, how, how does one get into layout art? It layout art. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you start learning that. I mean, uh, every layout artist I've known basically. If I take something that I've done layout on, and I think, oh, I did a really good job there. I spent all day laying out these six pages. I'm really, really proud of what I've done. Yeah. And then if I went and hand that same manuscript uh-huh. to one of these guys, that, uh, uh-huh. like some, some of the people that I work with, uh-huh. if I hand, hand the manuscript to them and they do the same thing and I put them next to each other, I just feel embarrassed by my own. <laughs> okay. Like, all this time and effort I put into this and... So, so, it's, so, so it's like, like take, not even a fraction as good as what but, they've done. So you, so so they're they're also a sort of special sort of artist because it's like if you've you've drawn your best dragon and you put it next to someone else, it's like oh, <laughs> this, yeah, this is not yeah. this is not a good dragon after all. I mean, it's not quite that bad because oh. I have zero art skills at all. Oh, okay, and I yeah. have some layout skills, yeah, but I've got sort of like five percent of the layout skills that a professional layout artist has. So oh, I can make something look presentable, but not not great yeah yeah yeah. so how would one present themselves to you as a layout artist just show me some layout you've done yeah so i mean sorry my mind's just boggling because i know for art you've got things like deviant art and so forth that's the one or instagram these are big places you can put pictures Mm. but where would you put examples of layout well, you could do you could do the same. I mean, you could yeah, take a screenshot okay. of your layout. Okay. You have a little yeah. portfolio, a little website portfolio. Generally speaking, I'm trying to remember it's not even how... a thing that you'd think to get into, is it? Because you you just sort of assume it just happens. 
but yeah, generally no. It doesn't. It's like editing. Like editors. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. think about editors either. Oh, but, and but believe me, the amount of editing it, so I've it's... done in the last couple of weeks of other people's words. Oh. <laughs> I'm not an editor. Oh, I thought publishing was about creating awesome worlds and making books and stuff, but no, it's about editing and editing and it's, editing it's, and it's, paying things and editing and doing spreadsheets and paying things and paying <laughs> things and editing and editing and paying things. Oh, dear, that sounds very really frustrating. <laughs> he said, laughing. Um, yeah, but editing, um, again, like to be an editor like because there's different sorts i know vaguely that there's different sorts like you've got proofreading which is going through and you're looking to correct mistakes spelling and grammar mm-hmm. look i suppose in rpg books as well there's like looking for technical terms that are being misused or the mm-hmm. wrong things that are being used but what about like what, what's your what's the actual editing thing are good editors easier to find are they hardest to find uh well again the problem with rpgs is yeah. Ed- editing an RPG is a little different to editing, say, a novel. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a mechanical expertise that's needed as well. So right. you might end up with two editors. You might end up with, you know, just a someone who edits the grammar and just, yeah, yeah, and yeah. just a sort of technical sort of text of course, edit- yeah, yeah. editor. And then yeah. you might have a mechanics editor who handles right. that side of things. Oh, that's... That, that, so it's basically you, you, you sort of got someone who's really good with words and someone who's really good with mechanics and it's important mm. to be able to... And if you're lucky, you find someone who's both. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, what's, what, what's, the, what's the process of editing? Uh, you get given a manuscript and then... Yeah, you get paid by word, just like you would if you were writing. Uh, okay. You get given a manuscript. You yeah. do... You, you, I, I mean, I imagine every different publisher does it differently. Of course, of course, yeah. So, I mean, but, well, well, we can't speak for every different publisher. Yeah. So you have your manuscript, and you'll do like the markup thing where the publisher mm-hmm. can see the changes you've made. Of course, yeah. And because you know, occasionally they might disagree with them, but um, yeah, generally speaking, you will mm-hmm. probably just glance through it, say yes, that's uh, that's all fine, and accept yeah. all the changes. Yeah, that's, bas- that's basically yeah. I mean, it's editing's hard work. It's, yeah, it's, a lot of it can be quite detail. grueling work. It's not like writing. Writing is kind of fun. Yeah, we turned the corner. Oh, this is exciting. And a spaceship, yeah. That's fun. I'd love doing that bit. Editing? No, that's not fun. Oh, well, I guess it's examples of different people having different different approaches because I, I, I find, like, writing text down is quite hard. But, like, going through and combing it over and making it so it's, like, perfect and it's really nice and reads mm. well and scans well. I find that quite pleasant, to be perfectly honest. What, self-editing? Um, no, like for other people's stuff as well. Like I've, Oh, I see. Like for, uh, what's it? It's mostly been things like uh, academic papers. Uh, but right. I've done a couple of novels for people just well, maybe because... you should be an editor, Peter. I bloody hate yeah, that should. process myself. I don't enjoy <laughs> that in the slightest. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Throw me over something sometime. I'll give it a go and let mm. me know if it's a terrible idea or not. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. So we talked about layout artists. We talked about editors. Who who else is on like the team that produces books? Uh, oh God, let's think about our team. So yeah, so you got your writer. Yeah, writer. Who's, artist. Who's going to submit submit a manuscript? An editor who's going to edit that manuscript. Possibly two editors. On a small company, the editor often ends up being the publisher, <laughs> depending on the of depending on the work. But you know, <laughs> then, I spoke you have, some <laughs> then you have then you have the art, yeah. Yeah, you have your, <laughs> you have your art director, yes, yeah, if yeah. you're lucky. Uh, you have your artists. Uh, then you have your layout designer, right? Okay. So after they've been through all those processes, you've then got essentially a PDF, a file. Mm. Yes. We then it's what you can do with that file. So you sell the PDF online if you want to get it printed. And um, there's yeah. a, a some more specifications you have to meet. There are PDFs and there are PDFs. Like some PDFs I've seen have basically just been it's just like the same as a book. It's got no interactivity, but like a a lot of PDFs nowadays, it's like you're, they, they demand things where like you click on the page and it almost mm. becomes a marked up 
HTML hypertext markup sort of thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, you could, yeah, you could put links and um, things like that in a PDF. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. Or and like indexing, a, it, who who does that? Uh, There's like, uh, let's not forget page XX. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a job in its own. It's yeah. not a fun job, but it's a job in yeah. its own. Yeah, well, um, who get who does that? Is that an editor job? Is that are there special people that do index? Is that are there indexers? Uh, they do exist. Really? But generally, we do it in-house just as a team effort. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the layout, the, the layout designer will generally take the lead on that, the way mm. we tend to do it. But everyone kind of pitches mm. in. It's not, it's not, an, you know, it's, it's, it's a picky job. It's not, it's not mm. easy. Yeah. But it has to be done. It is important. Oh, of course, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I do not possess the ability to easily count the number of times I've looked in an index. It's like, ah, oh, I can't find it anywhere. Yeah. This term I'm looking for. I just, you know, as the publisher, you end up being able to do a little bit of everything. That's what so the I can do a trades. little bit of layout, and I can do a little bit of editing, and I can do a little bit of this and that. But yeah. you know, none of those are my specialty. No, no. Um, but you've got sort of an understanding of what the jobs are, so that you can know what is a good one and what is a bad one, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Then, yeah, yeah. mm. yeah. of course, if you want to get this thing printed, we you have various mm. options there. And some oh. of those require extra stages and extra people too. Really? So if you're printing you know, on you, demand, yes. So you'll you'll probably be going probably going to drive to RPG if it's a yeah. RPG book oh, RPG or, product. They're, those are the people you go to. They go or, or through Amazon is the other one. Mm. There's two big oh, yeah. bigger print on demand options you have. Yeah, um, yeah. Each of those has different specifications for your PDF file. They won't accept right. each other's PDF files because of they course. just require different things. So one <laughs> thing will complain about something that the other one will accept just fine. The other yeah. one will complain about something else that the first one accepts just fine. So you end, up, oh. you end up with two different PDF files, one for each, and yeah. they've got different, very technical requirements on gar- yeah. margin sizes and gutters and all sorts of stuff. Right. So um, all that you have to, you have to match to the, the printer. Right, yes. Bleeds um, and yes, stuff. Yes, because the okay, I know some of these terms. Like the bleed is how much space you have to leave on the edge of the page as it's been printed to allow for like the ink bleeding into it. I think. Do you know what? I I'm not actually an expert on all the terminology there. I leave it I'm to not. the layout artist. No, no, but, fair, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So you can have bleed and you have no bleed, and that uh, mm-hmm. and that's kind of like when you have art that goes over the edge of the page. So it goes right up to the page and over the edge. Okay. As opposed to needing a gap between the edge of the art and the page. Oh, okay. No. I suppose then, and there's a lot of work goes in, there's a lot of people, a lot of effort goes into making a book, isn't there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so you have to do that, and then if you're going to drive through RPG, Mm -hmm. as an example, you finally have your correctly formatted PDF to, to their specifications. Yep. You upload it to their servers. Mm-hmm. They send it off to their printers, Lightning Source. Mm-hmm. Lightning Source review your files and get back to you. We mm-hmm. either accept them yep. or reject them. Okay. If they reject them, you, you start again at stage one. Ooh, and this okay. takes this takes between sort of one a, a, a one day and two weeks. It's hard to say how long that all this takes. It varies right. a lot. So okay. they then send send back. Say they say yeah, we've approved your file. You then have to order a proof. Yes which gets sent to you. And once you've seen that proof, you can approve it. That, and That's a proof copy, which is basically like, it's a physical copy yeah, of the book. Yeah. yeah. And once you've got that, then you can say, yeah, that's fine. That yeah. Will, yeah, that will take up to two weeks in total. It could take right. longer and shorter. Each of those stages is kind of random in how long it takes, but up to about okay. two weeks in total. Amazon, much quicker. Yes. You'll probably get all that done in about 48 hours. Very quick, because mm-hmm. Amazon will get you the book, you order it, you'll have it the next day. The, That's pretty super swift. quick. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, Amazon is much quicker. So, 48 mm-hmm. hours, maybe three days, but as, as long as there's no problems. But Amazon's a lot more picky. Right. So, you might end up going back and forth trying to get them to accept the files for, for a week or two before finally uh, one goes through and they go, yeah, okay. Okay. So, dr- drive through RPG will have more, more tolerance on mm. the file you submit. But it will mm. take longer for them to print. Whereas Amazon, very fine tolerances, but you will get it much quicker. Yeah. And then, yeah, of course, okay. your last option is going to be an offset print run. Right. Which is where you go to a printer and you have the printer print, you know, a thousand books or whatever, and then yeah. you sell those thousand books. But that is obviously a bit of a bigger ask because you, 
you'd have to have thought was like the money up front, wouldn't you? That's what you have Kickstarters for, isn't it? That is what you have Kickstarters. That's the whole point of Kickstarters, really paying for yeah. three months. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so that hmm. is going to work out way, way, way cheaper. Yes, like, like it might cost you sort of like eight or nine quid to print hmm. your book on Drive Through RPG and right. two to print it via an offset print run. And the more the more wow. copies you print, the lower that comes down. I don't know what Wizard of the Coast is paying per book, but they're probably uh, paying even less than that because they're, yeah. they're doing tens and tens of thousands of books at a time. And obviously economies of scale come in. Yeah, yeah. Then you have to, then you have to pay the publisher and then you physically sell the book and then the rest is profit. Well, you pay the printer. Yes. The printer then ships them, ships a pallet of books wherever you want okay. them to ship them. So now you've Go got on. a pallet of books. Yes. So this pound of books has to be stored somewhere. Uh, typically, as I recall, in the hallway of your house. <laughs> no, oh, I've never had a pound of books shipped here. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> no, I think I'd end up being divorced. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that did happen once, sure be... didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Be oh, no, that was, no, right, no, that was ridiculous. Right, that was, a, no. that was like three books yep. that I thought would just come in a box. Yeah, yeah. And they taped them to a pallet. <laughs> three books. Oh, it's really what, like bizarre. Three, three, not three book lines, but like there's three, three physical books. books. Yes, three, three, three physical books. books. And they take them to a pallet. Wrapped to a pallet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, oh so yeah, you get, pallet, you get a pallet of books. They get sent yeah. wherever you want, presumably yeah. to a warehouse somewhere. Yeah. yeah. They're distributors. Uh, uh, well, probably... Uh, maybe, or... No, not directly to the distributor. You're going to have oh. to store them. And then distributors right. will buy them off you. Oh, okay. Right. So they'll go to a warehouse. Yes. And they'll sit in a warehouse, and then you, cost you will be trying to sell them to a distributor yes. who might order 500 copies of you or 1,000 copies or whatever. Absolutely. And then you will, from your warehouse, mm-hmm. um, usually, I mean, you'll have a fulfillment partner, which is warehouse and shipper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll do that. And then they put the order through. You you call up your fulfillment partner and say, right, we need you to send 1,000 copies of this book to, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, Asmodi at this yeah. address. yeah. yeah. And then they do that. And then Ooh. the distributor from then, the distributor sells them on to the bookstores. Okay. And then from that, people in bookstores or buying from online will mm-hmm. then have their shiny book delivered to them. Yeah. Uh, well, the ones in the bookstores will go and pick them up. Yeah, yeah. they're in the bookstores. Oh, but yeah. otherwise, they'll, if you're they'll... selling them online, obviously your books are in your warehouse. Uh-huh. Your online store is yes. on your website. You now need to link those two things so that when Uh, an order comes in, you tell your fulfillment partner to send a book to that address. Yeah, Uh, A good fulfillment partner, you'll probably use Shopify or something like that, which is a common platform. And a good fulfillment partner will automatically have a system that links in with that. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to interfere manually. So if someone orders a book, they'll get the order, they'll send it out, and then they'll invoice you once a month for the shipping costs that they've done that month that they've incurred and you can pay that okay so well thank you that's a good introduction to the publishing industry exciting isn't it yeah well it's certainly very interesting so things that i personally have i'm taking away from this are layout artists are actually really are artists and they actually have a job that nobody's heard of um or that I certainly haven't heard of, so yeah, I'm making some assumptions. Well, they're the people that make sure your book doesn't look like a Word document and looks like an awesome book. They are. They bookify your book in many ways. They bookify your book. They are extremely important. They're the ones that will also, they'll be working with the printers to make sure those files are the right specification. Right. Yeah. So they're they're, they're really technical people. Yeah, yeah. So when you're self-publishing, you're taking on a lot of extra jobs other than writing. Yes, you're doing all those things. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there's, other, there's so many other tiny, tiny little things like getting mock-ups of your covers done and stuff. You know, oh, like right. you, you know those 3D book mock-ups you see. No. Yeah, you, we've, we've even looked at some today. Oh, okay. You know, when oh, you see course, like yeah. a mock-up of a book like standing up at a sort of isometric angle. It's not. Yeah. It's not the actual book itself, is it? No. That's like a mock-up. No, it's usually it's... long before the book even exists. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it looks like a yeah. photo of the book. So I'm yeah. thinking. That's the there's book. A, there's a million jobs like that that you end, that have right. to be done by somebody, which you don't even think yes. of until you come to have to do them. And you think, how the hell do you do that? Um, but there are there yeah. are tools online you can use for that. So one oh. one good tool for that yeah. is a website called Place It. Mm-hmm. And what it, what it has is it has like a billion different templates of mm-hmm. t-shirts and books and mugs and all yeah, sorts of yeah. stuff. But they're blank. Okay. 
Yeah. And you just upload your oh. art and it positions it on the 3D picture of the book. Yeah. And there you go. Bingo, you've got a 3D picture of the book. And you sort of move it around to make it say what you want to say. And yeah, oh, wow. Okay. Well, you, you'll, have your, you'll have your cover design done by your layout artist. So right. your artist will have produced the cover art. Your yeah. layout artist will have produced the cover design. So they'll yeah. send you an image of the actual cover, or they'll have an image with it. I mean, if you've got a layout artist, they can do all this themselves anyway. They know, they okay. know how. A layout artist yeah. knows how to make a 3D picture of a book. Okay. If you're doing yeah. it all yourself, you might have to yes. learn how to do that. But it's, mm. not, it's not that easy, that difficult. Really. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But there's a billion little things like that that you have to learn how to do, which you never, never really occurred to you were <laughs> jobs that had to be done. <laughs> Until you're actually... So I need to do this. Wait. Yeah. How, how, and then, how, how of course, you've got to publicize it. Oh, yes. Wow, that's, that's, that sounds like its own separate topic, mm. which would be... And which channels you'd go through. Mm. So shall we save that for another time? Let's do, let's do another, let's do another yeah. podcast on that. Next time we yeah, don't yeah, have yeah. a topic to talk about, we'll do that. Yeah. Next time we run out renounce of things to talk about, we'll, we'll talk about how does one publicize and advertise and what's the difference between them. An RPG source book. No, but thanks yeah. for that. That's, that's, I've, I've learned a lot today, believe it or not, so thank you for sharing. Okay. I don't, yeah. When people, when, you, when I talk about these things, I don't know whether I'm actually imparting useful information that people don't know or not, or whether I'm just uh, it's, saying it's, obvious it's, stuff. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah. Just well, because I, I live I, in I, that, and I've been doing that, and that's just my environment, it's hard to tell yeah, yeah. what it's is like insular to know. that and what is general knowledge. Well, I think there were some things I did know and some things I was wrong about. Mm. And there are some things that had never occurred to me. So doesn't sound like you to be wrong about things, Peter. Yeah, I I know it's unusual, (laughs) but yeah, I like to be the bigger man. (laughs) Don't get to it. (laughs) Well, that's been really good, but we 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 are definitely super over time, so we should probably wrap up. Okay then, hundredth episode next week. Next week, next week is a hundredth episode. We got Shane. We got Daryl. We got you. Oh. We got me. Woo-hoo. We've got Malak oh. the Maleficent. We have Yay. got people, hopefully, who have written in or recorded stuff. We've do, got. Do we actually have Malak the Maleficent? Is Malak going to be on the podcast? No, he's going to pre-record. No. He's going to pre. Basically, I've asked my brother Malak the Maleficent yeah. Yeah. to read our bad reviews in Malak's voice. Marvelous, marvelous. Mm. Looking forward to it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, good times, good times. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like it's going, to, it's, it's going to be a big listen next week. So yeah. just, well, I don't know what our topic's going to be, or if we'll even have one. I, it seems unlikely we'll have a topic. Right, now <laughs> let's wrap this up. Um, no, I mean this has been fantastic. I've learned so much today, and uh, yeah, hundredth episode. Looking forward to that. Woohoo! Yeah. Hmm. All right then. See you later then, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I look forward to uh, speaking to everyone next week. So it's, uh, I guess, goodbye from Peter Coffey from the Southampton Guild of Role Players. Yep, it most certainly is goodbye from Peter Coffey from the Southampton Guild of Role Players. Uh, too <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Apparently I now have to read this to you. This is the official podcast of Morris's unofficial tabletop RPG news, which you can find at enworld.org. You can find show notes at morris.podbean.com or wherever you found the podcast. If you feel like they deserve it, you can support the show on Patreon. In return, you will receive exclusive bonus content. Just go to patreon.com slash morris. If you're interested in his babbling nonsense, you can follow at Morris on the Twitter. Send your emails to morrispodcast at gmail.com. Not all of your emails, just the ones you want us to see. Mm, That's it. I'm bored now. You can go away. Shoo, off you go. Goodbye. Get out of here.